Tom here from Lawrence Systems, and I am joined by Jason Slagle and Matt Lee. How are you guys doing? Good. <laughs> How about you? I'm good. So this is a, a talk we did at CompTIA recently. So for those of you that were in person, uh, that was kind of impromptu because uh, things lined up, but we had a lot of fun yeah. with it. And we want to talk about how hacks actually happen, uh, not some of the things. Not We're not marketing people, by the way. None of us are. So we're, we're just going to talk about the experiences we have cumulatively working in the market, what we've seen happen, and, of course, give you a lot of tools to try yourself and poke at the network. So, like, do try this at home where you own the network and are allowed to do this. Uh, that's important. Don't uh, don't play a game and spearfish your friends. That's not necessarily what we're <laughs> aiming at here, unless you have their prior authorization. But we want to talk about how companies, how IT companies, especially our big targets. We see this in the news constantly. I don't think you can go any length of time without seeing another target attack because we hold the keys to many kingdoms. Therefore, we have giant targets part, part on our back. We cumulatively as people. People who all work in the MSP and IT space. Now, I do have links to uh, Jason and Matt and a lot of the different social media and posts that they do. But first, I want to mention they have a charity going on. Uh, I'll let Matt tell me about that one. Yeah. So, you know, about four years ago or so, my VP of operations asked me what it would take to shave my beard. Now, he happened to have kept me quite flush with cash and not in need of anything in dire emergency at the time. And I, I basically said, you know, there's a number, but you don't have it. Uh, he, he then postulated that, you know, would you do it for charity? And I said, man, that you got me where my heart is. Yeah, I would. <laughs> so I buried it for three years naturally and got away with it. Uh, and then Carrie Simpson or Carrie Richardson, uh, and Ian come, come up with this idea to ask if I would shave my beard for charity, uh, as an event and, and to try to drive some of their vision of how marketing could be done in some ways. And, and I said, you know what? I am in 100%. How would I say no? And so we set a $100,000 goal of which we're at 26,000 something of it with people kind of waiting in the wings of what this event will be to donate the tens and twenties of thousands of dollars from different corporations. But the intention is I wanted to find startup charities that were serving the need um, around, you know, the cyber community. And so I picked Bits and Bytes, which teaches eighth grade uh, kind of education around uh, uh, cyber. I've chose uh, Diversity Cyber Council, which is a gentleman and his friends that are ex-military that are giving back to underserved youth and populace in the greater Atlanta geo, uh, metro area. Uh, and then Women Who Code, which is um, around the globe, putting out content to, to educate and empower women around uh, STEM and coding and things like that um, in the professional career space. And Bike Walk Wichita, which is actually just a personal charity of mine. I was on the board for several years uh, and not any longer. But uh, And then the other one that I am on the board of, which is ha um, the Haunted Hacker, Mike Jones, has put together a Hackers for Vets charity that's a startup where they're going to ask for scholarships for people with you know successful exit DD-214s that are, that are looking to be in the cyber community. And really, it's going to be non-specific of how can I help you, how can I drive you forward. So, yeah, we're shaving our beard for charity for those, yeah. those five charities. Sh shaving a beard. And not just uh, Matt, there's actually numerous people participating. The links will be down there. Jason's on there too. Who's I don't know if I can point in the right direction. I'm trying. Yeah. 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 <laughs> Yeah, we're going to help these guys see their chin. If, if the charity hits the goals, these guys are going to, we're going to find out what their chins look like because yep. they're not sure either. It's been a minute. Yeah, it's been a minute. Yeah, about so. 18 months. And I think if we hit a certain amount, somebody was going to turn the beards into a wig and wear it around for the week. <laughs> yeah. Ian. But it, it is. I'm going to hold them to it. That's a lie. Yeah, we're recording this in August of 2022. The charity's running until, is it November? Of, yeah, yeah. That's November this year. If not, it'll be November next year. We we will make the goal. Yep, this will happen again. So, so if you're watching shave. this past November 2022, uh, this will still be going on. So as I said, links to uh, that information will be kept up to date down below. Now let's get into the meat of this, and that's what people are really here for: is how would I hack you? And let me quickly define you though. Is going to be narrowed in scope a little bit. Who may be an individual if you're a very high value target. Um, it's not as likely that a personal general home user be targeted and using these attacks. Not that it's not impossible, but less common. The real common and the people we want to focus on for our audience is people who own or work at IT MSP businesses, uh, people who maybe are a group or a team at a large corporation of IT professionals, because um, they kind of work as an, almost an independent unit, but attacking those people and leveraging sometimes people to get an in. It's going to be a lot of the audience we're pointing at here. And as I said, we're going to be leaving links to all these tools and everything else so you can kind of walk through the methodical process that the threat actors do when they choose a target. Yeah. Yeah, and, and, and you can also be defined typically as people with infrastructure that's exposed, 
you know, but also people that are high value targets in a force multiplier perspective. Yes. Right? If we can attack an MSP, then I can now attack hundreds of companies because of that position of trust and uh, something we might touch on as we go through this conversation. Yes. I think we're going to start with the external recon part of this. Uh, do you have some tabs to share with us, Jason, with uh, some DNS dumpster? <clears throat> yeah, we're going to. Uh, so we kind of decided we were going to pick on uh, net standard. And I, I hate the word pick on, but uh, they were an MSP. Used as a teaching tool from yeah, the use, information. Use, in our use as a teaching tool. You can, ser you can be served uh, as an example because they were they had a lot of exposed stuff there in the news for a recent breach that seems to be rather large. We don't know the details. Alleged breach. Uh, alleged breach. Time. Alleged. Yeah. <laughs> Incident. We'll, we'll start with there. Yeah. Uh, you don't say the B word. Yeah. Right. Uh, so, you know, we were kind of postulating uh, we, as we developed this talk for ChannelCon. Uh, at first, our kind of thought was that we were going to try to find some MSP in the room to pick on them or to uh, to show them. Uh, and we decided that that was probably not a great idea. So. <laughs> Uh, we decided to pivot a little bit and look at uh, a breach or uh, a incident that is uh, in progress. And we, we've all heard about it's been in the news and, and kind of formulate how if we were the threat actors, we might have approached it. Uh, so from a I'm going to share my screen here. In theory. Now, to find where Jason lands, we've probably found an IP address or maybe a name of an MSP or something yeah. in some <clears throat> overall network scanning. Um, that yeah. probably triggered us to this. So this won't be as specifically targeted in the beginning, but it would start probably just as me stumbling on you as I'm running large swaths of the internet for a certain particular Yeah, uh, you start yeah. poking on Shodan and looking for exposed ESI, ESXi infrastructure, and we know that's something that these people have. We know that this yeah. uh, there was a message in the initial access broker forums yeah. for them going through and figuring out going, hey, this is... Uh, you know, a company that's we have a potential breach for to be able to. Yeah, well, and it was it was really interesting because you bring up a good point, Tom. In the in this, the Johnny foreshadowing to this event, we knew that there was this access broker saying, and maybe not even really a good access broker, just someone that stumbled on something and said, "Hey, I have this. I don't have malware to attack it. It's lots of VMware servers. Can somebody go and have these with me?" Right. right, like, like legitimately, you guys want to split this up, and and, yep. and he put down bit. He or she put down Bitcoin, half a Bitcoin, which is about what thirteen thousand, twelve thousand mm -hmm. dollars, um, to prove that they had some legitimacy and financial backing. So, yeah, uh, interesting so, part of that story. Go uh, ahead and zoom that in, Jason. Cool. Uh, I actually shared the whole window. So, so what we have here is we have a tool. It's called CRT SH, right? In in since uh, roughly two thousand seven ish, I think maybe two thousand eight. Uh, every certificate that's been issued is part of essentially a public record, right? So if, if it, an SSL certificate is issued, uh, we can look at that chain of issued certs and we can, uh, it's public record, we can look through it. Yeah. Right? So one of the first things that I typically do when I'm uh, investigating a domain is like, let's see what subdomains we can actually discover uh, or what other things they're hiding under their SSL search, right? So without well, having to brute force it, right? Yeah, without having correct. to do any of that kind of enumeration, we're looking at because you issued a cert, you probably wanted to protect it, yep. and as a result, I'm going to know where to attack it in a lot of in a lot of cases. Yeah. So, and and so of note here, this this doesn't really reveal a ton. A scan is kind of interesting. I don't I don't know what that is, and I I didn't really look at it. But like go and info, I, I assume Stall and get marketing. I mean, those are yeah. all marketing domains. I mean, yeah. everyone has those. Or if you if you're bigger and you're sending email out as uh, various things, these are probably just email domains. But yeah. most of their actual infrastructure is actually hidden behind a wildcard um, cert. Yeah. Uh, and, and so essentially it's invisible to me as far as from certificate standards, right? I, I can't really identify a lot here. And this is actually somewhat unusual uh, because I find certificates to be a really useful way in many and, cases. And here it's the opposite domain. side. Yeah. Yeah. It's much uh, shorter on this. Yeah. I mean, and, there's and, a you ton know, of certificates, but yeah, they're all... Where else can we uh, get this kind of information, Jason? So if users are enumerating this in a normal day-to-day -day basis, how can we get that data if we can't find it in, in a cert dump? Well, I can use a tool uh, such as DNS Dumpster, and I'll zoom that guy in too here. Uh, so DNS Dumpster uh, aggregates. Uh, it's a service of, oh, I forget. It's at the bottom of the page here. We'll scroll all the way down. <laughs> Uh, it aggregates it's a DNS service yeah. of hacker target. That's it. Okay. So and it's a free service, by the way, it's a free yeah, service. Yeah. 
Uh, and basically, you can put any domain name in there, and it will show you all of the A records it's able to find via a bunch of other services that it basically aggregates. It's also not doing yep. a brute force attack. Uh, but when we go into here, uh, suddenly the world gets a lot more interesting. Yeah, uh, we we see some firewalls here, right? Uh, if stacks, I if we could make stacks. one point out first off, yeah, using public DNS records naming the target and its juiciness by its yeah. first seven characters it is wonderful is, is probably not an opsec move that's no. oh no no wonderful right? from, <laughs> we're pretending to be attackers so it's great <laughs> from the other side no no you revealed i mean come on esx i know what I that is on there yeah and, yeah in, in putting uh in putting all of your infrastructure that traditionally for me would have been private and oh hidden, for sure right? yeah like the service console interface of an esx host like what that would I, it would never even occur to me that that would be a thing that I would ever put on a public IP. And, and to their credit, maybe they had ACLs on the public IPs. Maybe they had things that were meant to yeah. take that very public infrastructure and create it as somewhat of a private WAN. And stylistically, and potentially through my experience, I would never do that either. Uh, even in that yeah. case, I would route a private network or I would route a VPN le level network of some sort over IPsec. But yeah. We, I mean, for yes. some of our infrastructure, we have internal domains. For some of it, we have, uh, like, basically, we'll use d dot something dot cnwr dot com, or it's yeah, uh, and a lot of it's public domains that was also private IPs, right? Like, you can still yeah. do that as a <laughs> method of delivering that DNS right. capability. Yeah. But, um, uh, but, but of note here, ability. a couple things that immediately stood out to me. We have a uh, VCSA here. So if you're not familiar, VCSA is uh, it, it is uh, VMware or v, vCenter server appliance, right? And vCenter is the like management layer that manages the SXI host. So we have a lab one exposed to the internet. Yeah. If we scroll we down could even always farther, start with the lab as the threat actor yeah. so that they don't discover it as quickly, right? Because the theory would be the lab side would not maybe have as quickly of a rubber band effect on us. A hundred percent. And I mean, yeah. this is all in the same slash 16 here, right? So like in yeah. theory, it can all talk to each other, right? So yeah. I pop the lab and see where I can move laterally. Here's their main vCenter. Uh, uh, this guy here, this uh, Wi-Fi controller is actually a Unify controller. I did look. It is patched for Log4J. Yeah. Uh, so at least we got, they got that going for him. Yeah. Uh, and then of note, when we were digging through this the other day, uh, one of the things we found was connect and it's up here a little bit, but we popped connect into Shodan. Uh, so Shodan's another tool, Shodan.io. Uh, if yep. you keep your eye out, so Shodan, you get very limited. Is that an eye joke, free. Jason? You know, I only have one eye. Here, you're going to say, keep yeah. your eye out. Yeah. Keep, <laughs> right. It's not nice. It hurts my heart, bro. Oh, sorry. <laughs> sorry, bro. Uh, it, it, if you look, uh, you can, you can find sales. They run them what twice a year ish. Mm -hmm. So I'm you sure can get like, basically yeah. unlimited. It's limited access for life, right? So you don't get access to everything, but you get access to more searches, more API APIs, hits. It's like yeah. Five bucks usually, yeah. ten bucks, five, it's five or ten dollars, and they usually run a Black Friday special, yeah. um, and they run some type of spring sale as well. Yeah, but it's great because it gets you that extra layer you're looking for, and you can use the. Um, API commands from the command line. You load it up yeah. in Linux. It just makes it handy because you can just start dropping in IP addresses. Oh, yeah. You can script your recon essentially. Uh, plus, the, it, and by the way, for that small amount of money, they offer monitoring. You can monitor your own things to yep. see if you mm -hmm. show up in Shodan um, for that. It's really inexpensive. It's really low hanging fruit. And their pricing, they have a, a basic beginner's uh, pricing now too if you don't buy it on sale. So yep. you can kind of start using this right away without having to wait till a Black Friday special. But yeah. There's a uh, it the, shows a lot of good advanced stuff is expensive. The ability to search for like vulnerabilities and stuff gets a little pricier. Yeah. yeah. Uh, but I mean, I haven't found a need for it. When I have found it, I have enough friends in the industry that I can usually get somebody that's paying for it to, to <laughs> run the query I need to run. So uh, but here we actually so when we were talking about this uh, last week, uh, we actually I surmised that I thought this was screen was screen connect. connect. Yeah, yeah but right. it was not. Uh, and so we poked at it and it turns out it's actually already web. Uh, yeah. I don't know. If and that's it's better in the same worse. slash 16 too, right? Oh, so theoretically based on segmentation, we might have full access. Yeah. All of this stuff is in the same slash 16, right? So here, here in this instance, we have, you know, already web exposed to the world, right? So we can go look at vCenter. And if you're doing enumeration like this, it's very helpful to think, you know, what should I be documenting? What should I be writing down? And, and that's what the threat actors are doing here is they're going, okay, we found a VCSA. All right, we found maybe an RD web. 
And then yep. the next step, you know, after you go through Shodan and find what's exposed and see if you can determine a little more about that service, right? I saw it was on IIS 10, which meant it was probably on, you know, a newer server iteration. You know, so you, you can learn a little bit about that so that you can then take and, and take those vulnerabilities and, and find and map them to vulnerabilities. So um, when you were showing the class, you also brought us to a way to look through a lot of those vulnerabilities, Jason. Does, oh, you yeah, yeah, have, yeah, yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yep. That is 100%. Uh, Exploit dash DB. DB. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, so, so actually, to your point, you know, when I'm doing this uh, as an engagement, so let's say I'm uh, doing a, 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 a pen test or an external vulnerability uh, assessment for a client, uh, I usually have a OneNote notebook running where it's like I'm just brain dumping stuff I find. Yeah. Find it right. I like, like it's mind like, maps myself. Yeah, that's my method. I, I'm, that starting, I'm starting to get there. Uh, yeah. I haven't quite gotten there yet, but it's like I don't. Otherwise, I'm very squirrel. It's like I'll go <laughs> yeah. off on a tangent, and it's like I have to. It's like <laughs> if I write it down, then I can come back to it later. Yeah. Ooh, shiny object. Ooh, shiny yeah. object. Yeah. yeah 100%. And, and there's a lot you can find here. And what you start looking for is as you find these, and this is still very passive. We're looking at Shodan. Uh, I think Shodan did enumerate their Unify controller, but Unify makes it easy because they'll tell you the version. That's how Jason knew right away. Yeah. It was patch for log for J because right in the page it gives up as the version. Lots of software does that. And then yeah. this next thing you do is you head over to the exploit. You're going to start looking at, all right, what, you know, is exploitable on this particular version. Yeah. Which if I was giving any advice to a vendor that creates uh, 8443. Yeah. Yeah. That creates this stuff. I would say, Hey, don't, uh, don't put right in your Ajax response on the front page, your version. So I can determine instantly whether I attack you. I talked about this at the, at the speech we gave, I did a research project, Tom, um, in, in a bunch of the major cities in the United States. And I pulled up Unify controllers from Shodan. Um, and I went and looked at the page because right there in the middle, if you see under Unify, you see 6554, which is not one of the subject vulnerable versions. Yeah. But you could go look for those versions manually. And so what I did was I just got a giant Excel sheet and I just put out every city, the top you know 100 I looked at, were they vulnerable or were they not vulnerable? Right. And in addition to that, threat actors will chain small vulnerabilities. Right. So you get a tiny vulnerability like Log4j that gives me access to the Unify tiny. user. Uh, yeah, tiny, fair, touche. Sorry. <laughs> I apologize for the PTSD out there. That's on me. <laughs> but this this massive vulnerability log4j, um, but it, it, it is limited to the user scope. And so I now didn't have very much I could do. I could mess around with the Unified database. Maybe I take out some networks. I could do some things like that. But I couldn't really do anything to monetize what I was doing. I wanted to land, pivot, and expand. And so I needed to gain you know um, uh, privileged access. Um, and right at the same time, and also included in the same version, uh, you had PwnKit, uh, which was a uh, poll kit vul uh, vulnerability in Linux that was just massive again. Um, but it did give escalation capabilities. And I was able to use uh, a string of log4j and pwn kit to demonstrate that I could script my way through 5000 of these vulnerable controllers. And I'll ask you guys if you remember the stat, what percentage was the overall of the entire country of the United States as I got done with these major cities? What percentage were vulnerable two months after Log4j? You said it was between 60 and 70, if I recall. It's massive. Yeah, yeah it was yeah. 60 to 70 percent. Some some geos were like way better. And I will say there's a hosting platform out there, Hostify, that I did not find a single one of, of their controllers yep. to be vulnerable. My friend Riley was very on top of it. He yeah, was... bro, it was a hundo P. <laughs> I could not do anything. I mean, I did not enumerate his network. I just want to state that, you know, legally, yeah. you know, yeah. here. Um, but he did a good job. <laughs> so tell him kudos. <laughs> <laughs> spends a lot of time thinking about these things. Uh, he's extremely engaged with the cybersecurity side of it. Um, yeah. And go in once if you go back over to the Unify network. Um, there, one thing I've noticed here, and this is important to Matt Lee's point. See, they're running six five five four is patch log for J, but yes. that's still an old version. Uh, mm -hmm. That yep. means they they're doing the minimum. They're on the maintain. sevens now. Yeah, yeah, they're well, all sevens. You may now, not but... want seven, but uh, yes, I'm running seven at home, and it sixes. hadn't failed me. But you're right. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. Uh, there are um, definitely uh, th things to consider before you do a major version upgrade with that. <laughs> yeah, for sure. Well, let's bring it back, though, because we're now in this phase where we've enumerated some surface yep. area. Yep. We're looking for vulnerabilities. So what are you using here, Jason? I think this looks like a search platform where yep. you can just type in what you found. Yeah, so this is exploit database. If you happen to have a Kali box, uh, you can use search search exploit and yep. uh, uh, to basically search like a local copy of it that gets installed. And this is like a shopping cart. It's like Amazon for exploits. Yeah. Uh, so you can basically <laughs> just type in a product name and if there's a POC for it or an exploit, uh, you can usually find it. 
Uh, and we can see here, you know, we have a VMware 7 RCE. This one's a little older, it's from 2021, right? So, uh, but if if they weren't patched, then uh, then here's this random Python 2, because uh, one thing yeah. I've noticed I about uh, threat actors and, and people that write these like POCs, they just don't like Python 3 for some reason. I know, I know. <laughs> I I, and I, what's bad is just to admit my own stupidity. I can't tell you how many times I've banged on the keyboard against failure after failure for certain vo like uh, dependencies, not mm -hmm. realizing, oh, I had to do a switch back to Python 2 and I'd be fine. Yeah. yeah, like I'm just stupid. <laughs> and what I want to highlight about this is there's plenty of places you listing CVEs and known problems, but this is so much more fun because this is the exploit itself. It's mm -hmm. here's the Python, here's the code. Yep. You can just download and grab it. And this is how easy it's become to start building it. People think, and not just not to discount it, that there is some hard work involved in being a ransomware operator, but this is making it easier for them. Like, oh, we'll just grab this. It's not, I mean, people say, well, why don't they shut down something like this? Because it's making it easier. But the other side of it is it's making it easier for red teams to do their job and expose and go, look, this yep. is how you would do this. Um, it also allows you, the owner of this network, to say, I wonder if this is really vulnerable or what would happen. So you can actually use these tools to, well, point them at yourself, start doing your own security testing. Um, the reality is, even if someone didn't make this fancy website, they were doing it before this fancy website existed. 100%. <laughs> it isn't. <laughs> Th this would just exist it would just be an onion link right like so like yeah. the, it doesn't really the barrier of entry of hiding it or making it public that's nothing right like it and, this and yeah. even without this if you go search a, a vulnerability or a cve yep. um i can go find poc and github yeah, a thousand I mean, times right. faster we can, than we can do this we can do that right now yeah. we can do cve that and then just do uh just POC, get a GitHub, right yeah, yeah there we go, there you go. boom right there it, it's right, going to be yeah. findable it's, yeah, just, it's yeah. not hard, gents and ladies that are watching this, right? No, home, it's but, not. Yeah. So it's it's actually somewhat interesting because as we were developing this talk, you know, we kind of went okay. through, and this is kind of my thing that I'll do. Like, and, and there there's more that I would potentially do here, uh, but you know, I would start by seeing what public stuff's attackable. Uh, if they were local, and I really, really, really wanted to get them. Uh, I, I know now that they're a provider from over here in DNS dumpster. Uh, I know that this is light edge. Yep. Uh, you know, I. It's time for a clipboard and a white Yeah, <laughs> 100% or a call, right? It's, uh, yeah. you know, I had a provider the other day that or somebody I was poking or poking at or looking at the other day, right? And I could see they were on Spectrum. So, you know, I'll call up, uh, potentially I'll call up their receptionist and say, hey, I need to patch your cable modem against that uh, new uh, Eris. Yeah. bug that's been in the news right so like hey can you get me remote access to this pc so i can do it right and then yeah, maybe yeah, give yeah, her totally. a screen connect link or something like that to get in i, I would approach the least technical person i could to do that right a little bit of social engineering there and they're in with this information but, there's just so much you can do and now that we're kind of going out of the identity social social piece of this i think i'm going to hand it over to uh mr lee here for a bit yeah 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 let's let's uh see if i'm capable of creating a screen share there's there's been you know larger things that have whooped me today so we're gonna <laughs> we're gonna go with it um but i'm gonna go with this screen over here i'm gonna do the whole screen because i'm living living large um you know one of the things jason said is you know we taught we would attack the infrastructure would start with what we have from an infrastructure perspective um and and i i like that because now you're starting to know what assets are out there um, I wanted to bring up a couple pieces. Tom had, had kind of turned me on to this, but if you're wondering how do you get started on some of this, there's some really good guides out there around what do you do next, right? Right now we're kind of in the recon and enumeration space um, from that perspective, but walks you through a lot of this. But the point I was going to make was Jason focuses very infrastructurally. I believe that we're in this bit of a schism, Tom and, and Jason, already in our world where we have a legacy infrastructural vision of the world and a, a identity centric vision as extensibility starts to become single sign on SaaS consumption. <clears throat> now attacking the identity is the same as what would have been attacking the network in the past, right? Because if I get to that privileged user, a user has access to those accounting files or access, then I have ubiquitous access to those through those identities. So right. I would probably attack you from an identity centrism type approach. Um, and I would probably focus on those single sign on tokens. So the first one I want to talk about is Microsoft came out with a release saying that 10,000 organizations since September 2021 had been hit from a AITM, which is just their rewording of man in the middle now is adversary in the middle uh, or attacker in the middle, depending on the way you've read it before. Um, but essentially it's saying, hey, I'm going to take your passwords like I usually did, but I'm also going to go ahead and steal the very essence of the identity centric world, which is a token. 
Once I have that cookie, which we all know cookies, and that cookie is a token that's a cryptographically signed identity and group membership package, if you will, depending on whether it's, you know, Sam will gets into a whole different conversation, but focusing on OAuth or uh, OIDC, um, I want to steal that token. And so Microsoft says, hey, listen, there's tons of people that have done this. And also it gets by MFA, right? As, as a threat actor, I stand up a, a, a uh, Zoom uh, that in session. a little bit, Matt. Let's yeah, no focus problem. on that little piece right there. As a threat actor, I spin up a um, redirector, essentially a middleware server that's running um, an emulator that basically takes what you're seeing and then re-encapsulates it and transmits it off to Microsoft and brings it back. So as the attacker, I send a phishing email to you if you go from this red guy over to the right. Um, I have a redirector page. So I, I bought Microsoft-Online-Offline.com, and I owned it for all of like seven minutes when I was doing my <laughs> tests. As soon as it saw a certain Let's Encrypt, it was gone. They did a domain seizure back. Uh, yeah, touche. Um, <laughs> and then there's a man in the middle or an adversary in the middle phishing page, and that page has a, a cert. Um, I can spin up that cert through Let's Encrypt for free. It doesn't even cost me anything, right? I can probably get the domain name for free. The first time I did this, I was getting it from those free domain pools. Um, but Microsoft's faster to take those back. Um, yeah. And then um, I have somebody land on that page. Now, to the user, they're seeing a visual of a green check, a lock in the top corner. It's beautifully encrypted. Everything's fine. Um, but it's taking over and sending that back and forth session to Microsoft. So the credential is compromised. I actually take that. And then I also grab the token after it's wrapped up from Microsoft. Now, depending on how you have that setting set, I can take that token portably and bring it into another Google browser and be you. And that's what I mean by I don't care about the network because I'm going to land in the network vis-a-vis -vis being you, right? I mean, depending on how, how the architecture is set up, right? But... In this case, they go on to use it as a business email compromise. I would start looking through your email, trying to find out what, what core systems you have, what password resets you've done from things. I would be having filters and word searches to go through that and find the right stuff and find your lab tech instance, your screen connect location. And then I would start to use that identity to extend or break in and have capabilities, set up forwarding rules for password resets, mm -hmm. make it so that I can get those password resets and become you. Um, but then that's loud, right? The, the method Jason's making is a little less loud in the sense that <clears throat> he's coming in, an, in a trusted system and becoming some trusted process inside those systems, if you will, right, that's running and gaining. I, I'm trying to say, as long as I can trick or get past the one user, I can get in as that user and, and elicit my behavior. So these AITMs are very, very valuable for that, for and, that purpose. And it's, a lot of people mistakenly think, and this is where the cat and mouse came. Now, Microsoft is, and the chuckle is because uh, both these gentlemen have registered domains and to see how fast Microsoft will take them back down. <laughs> it's really quick. <laughs> We've wasted a few dollars on domains. About 24 hours. About 24 hours. Uh, so, it, But that also leverages, it's really interesting problem because if you're a target, and it's worth it. D domains are cheap. And mm -hmm. if I can get this to happen in a small window, the fact that this gets spun up so fast happens on a domain that was not previously known by any web filtering tools or yeah. anything like that. This is how a lot of these are bypassed. Everyone thinks, oh, my web filter, my AV, my firewall with a beautiful block list that's real time updated from the firewall vendor will just stop all of these. And these aren't things I have to worry about. But unfortunately, that's just not the truth. And, and Tom, I have 30 or 40 domains that I've let bake in that I've set yeah. up with legitimate pages, that I've set up and let run, that I own, that I just keep as these clean room domains, right? Like, and it wouldn't yes. be hard to do that as, a, as an ongoing systemic yeah. basis. Have 50 domains in reserve, so you can always get one through a filter. Go register it as positives, make the exceptions on filters like FortiGate and, and the big mm -hmm. ones that are the big five. And so, yeah, that's not hard to do, right? To, to get through those AV systems. Exactly. And, so, and, yeah. Well, back when we did a lot of WordPress work, <clears throat> I would run into people who couldn't figure out why they were just getting an immense amount of traffic. And I'd find a sub domain of their WordPress because they took an established uh, domain, popped it from an unupdated WordPress, yep. installed something that would collect all these. So you already have a trusted domain. One of them was a printing company. Like they just, right. did, you know, very generic and had been established for years without an update. <clears throat> um, so it passes all the muster of your usual filters. Yeah, these they're a local print operating company. Um, nothing about them looks suspicious, but there is a subdomain that seems to look exactly like a Microsoft login. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. <laughs> the average user may not notice that, right? I was just going to say that, like, in, in many cases, because you use 365 SSO to sign into so many things, like, do you do you validate that you actually land on a Microsoft.com URL every time you do yeah. that? Because, I mean, I do 
sometimes, well, right? That's a great point, though, Jason. So how can people protect themselves? I like to give some pragmatic things around mm -hmm. this. How can you protect yourself? If you look at your Microsoft conditional access space, you can, and hopefully you're using conditional access. When Jason and I asked this question in the presentation, we had like three people raise their hand, which was horrifying to me. <laughs> like out of 25? Yeah, yeah. yeah, or something at, like that. At a, at a CompTIA conference of MSP and IT business owners. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Not, yeah. not a general public conference here. Yeah. <laughs> but if you're using CA, there is a persistence setting that will say, if this token is moved in some way, if fingerprint changes to the underlying browser, don't let it be used, which almost helps protect against this in a lot of ways because now I have to attack you during the session, right? I have to harvest data while the session's there as I'm ITM and stealing data that way. That's a very limited window compared to owning you. Um, so that's the first one. The second one would be set session timeouts. Mm -hmm. So even if you do have something, say, hey, I think the default's like nine months or six months, six months yeah, is what it is, 180 months. days. Um, and so take that default down. My techs had to re-authenticate every week, but if you're signing into Azure Active Directory, it doesn't matter. It's automatically done by your TPM. But if if you have the session tokens set really low, you can set them even lower for more um, yeah. advanced things, right? Our, uh, RIT glue is daily, like yeah. things like that. Like you Preach can't. It. I think it's eight hours. So that's this can't be understated, right? I've been on kind of my soapbox here about this for a little bit because everyone's pushing SSO as the solution to all these problems. This and, bypasses and, yeah, NFA and, and takes SSO the, to a horrible level. The, <laughs> yeah. the problem right. is, is that the default out of the box settings uh, are. I, I would argue potentially less secure if a token is stolen. Well, 100% less secure if a token is stolen uh, than if you're uh, then having separate passwords, right? Yep. Uh, oh, yeah. The, and, and more importantly, uh, if you're running business basic or business standard, you actually can't make them more secure. You have to be up at the business premium because you need Azure ADP1 yep. uh, to be able to set any of this stuff. Yeah. Yeah, and, and that's not me saying that, nor PAX8. I just want to make sure yeah. it didn't seem like a shameless plug. But yes, business premium for sure. Um, yeah. The other piece I want to show, though, is if this is the attack, and this is how I would get in, and, and I've talked about how to defend yourself, I want to show you how easy it is to do. Evil um, Jinx or Zoom Evil Jinx. Uh, yeah, Evil Jinx or Evil Jinx is a platform that is made in 2017, which uses a custom version of Nginx, which is most people's proxy in a lot of cases, right? The web mm -hmm. application firewalls, things like that run Nginx in a, in a lot of ways. Um, and so, uh, or Nginx, am I being an I idiot call here? It, I call it Nginx. Nginx. I call apologize Nginx, for being stupid. It's okay. I'm weird. I'm a I listen. <laughs> <laughs> HTTP <laughs> server to provide man in the middle or AITM functionality to act as a proxy between a browser and a fished website, which means... I don't even have to be very good at what I do. I'm a script kitty, right? For me to stand this up and get my firewall port set and get the domain name set, it's pretty reasonably easy to use. I, I, I don't know if I'd describe it as e extremely, but it's pretty reasonably easy to use. Now, I will say there's a current bug with this. Um, the author only gives this out in private now, Kay Gretzky, um, but their token harvesting methodology is broken because Microsoft updated their schema, and the current schema in this has not been fixed. There's some community out there that, that have fixed it, but in general, General, it's not going to grab a token today unless you've already reached out to the author. Yeah. Anyways, unless you've already reached out and gotten that uh, parsed code di difference, uh, that doesn't seem like they're going to update. But the point is what it does, is it makes this little site. You direct people to it with that phishing email we talked about. And if you notice here in, in this section um, that's blurred out a little bit, that's the remote IP of who signed into your, your attack, what the fishlet was, which was Google in this case, what the password was, and what the remote IP, and what time of the actual stealing that. And then if you zoom in, you'll get the token as well. Um, but uh, and zoom in, I mean, like type in ID19 as you're in that system and bring up that yeah. that, that session. And this is linked in, in <clears throat> below, so you can write, look at the GitHub page yeah, and look yeah. at it and dive in. And I have it. a video of me demonstrating that that we can link below as well. And that'll be linked well. down below as well. Um, but if you look, four years ago, so I mean, this has been around since 2017. That's five years, at least best I can calculate this. So for Microsoft to be releasing, hey, people are under attack now, um, I just want you to know how endemic the identity attack is and how easy it is for me to do. It, it's really, yeah. really simple. Um, somebody somebody publicly mentioned it, so they finally had to admit it existed is basically <laughs> yeah. what landed. Yeah, that, that's another advantage these tools have because sometimes Microsoft, um, I, I think the Microsoft will not fix list is in our link somewhere. Yeah. Um, oh, no. <laughs> yeah. Microsoft. Most of them are fixed now for what it's worth, but yes. But it took someone making a public list of Microsoft will not fix these problems. It takes almost people like us just displaying it, getting awareness out there that these flaws exist for Microsoft goes fine. I guess we'll do something about it. Like, I, 
I actually got hung by my own petards on this one one time, Tom. So I found a vulnerability when you when you joined Azure Active Directory um, as a uh, secondary measure without administrative rights. Like let's say you open Outlook and there's a requirement for MAM or Outlook and there's a requirement for 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 that. It brings your device into that MAM management, but it doesn't give you MEM management. It doesn't give you the ability to like run scripts and things like that. Supposedly. Um, what I was able to find is that if I took that shadow device and put it in a group with a script in MIM, it would execute that script, whatever it was, under privilege. And so I was able to do privesks. Um, I actually had an MSP that took over a client, and they were like, hey, I can't get access. They won't give us the admin creds. We need to take all these systems and move them over. And I was like, I have a theory try this. And they didn't. It worked. And I was horrified. Right. So they were able to, to gain access and privilege to every single machine and put an admin, admin account in um, so they could do what they needed to do. Um, but the point was Microsoft, I worked at two paths. I submitted a bug bounty and I was like, man, I'm gonna get my first bug bounty with Microsoft. This is awesome. But I also talked to a lot of my insider people from the um, stuff that I do in advisory. They fixed it. And when the bug bounty finally looked at it, they said, you aren't qualified because we already fixed it in the production release. Yes, this is possible. We fixed it. And I was like, but how was the production release, you sorry bastards? Uh, <laughs> anyways, but um, but joking aside, I would attack the identity and I would use something like a AITM methodology. The, the next way, though, that's, that could be attacked is, is a little bit even scarier um, because this is something that I don't have a lot of great answers for and I'd love your advice, but... FBI warns that deep fakes might be used in remote job interviews. If you have a decent, you know, PC like maybe what Jason's talking about for his new, <laughs> for his new uh, uh, production machine that he's building, but uh, but if you have a decent machine, you can run software to take your live webcam and overwrite that with a hundred percent of of a pretty, I mean, really good. I played around with it for three or four hours and got some really good ability to do that um, with a clean green screen, a lot of good Im information. But the deep fake software is not hard to run. Um, and they're saying, listen, I could call up Tom and say, hey, Tom, you've got this open position at your MSP. Uh, my name is Jason Slagle. Uh, I think we've met before. We've joked around. Right? Probably that one wouldn't be great just because of the deep personal relationship. Mm -hmm. But if I was calling any other MSP, <laughs> but, right? Yeah. Let's talk about remote hiring. And this is where it gets really scary because, and we'll throw this out there for my friend Riley at Hostify. I had shared some links with him about this because he's not met his employees. And yeah. Think about that. He's built a large company and uh, he had posted today. They they reached a new, they've got several, 2,200, mostly MSPs signed up using his stuff. He's got over four, uh, 400,000 devices under management at Hostify, but he hasn't met his employees that help operate all this directly. And they live globally. And this came up and I think Jason may know what I'm talking about here. There was a private chat in a vendor group we had where someone had cloned and faked as if they worked uh, a bunch of projects in GitHub. Mm -hmm. And it was only through the suspiciousness of it. They actually built a clever resume. If I'm not if I'm not mistaken, the way they uh, faked their GitHub essentially was they cloned different um, histories for other people. But the hiring person said, I'm really suspicious of this person because they seem to be really smart at a very young age and have contributed yeah. immensely to all these things. And they were able to backdate a bunch of stuff. Combine that with deep fakes, you can build <laughs> quite the profile to be a great remote hire candidate that checks a lot of boxes you participate in github you seem to have a presence because they were able to exploit a way that lets you backdate comments yeah. uh, you in don't GitHub. even have to yeah they just rewrote the history so that they were the committer yeah. yeah yeah so it looks like they did all these commits it's a lot of cleverness and it's hard to decipher as a hiring manager mm -hmm. especially we're, and we're talking like our technical skill level didn't make it obvious to look at that we it, we would have passed our smell test and we're cybersecurity people to an extent you know what i mean this is yeah what do you yeah, feel Jason? How would, what would you have picked up on it easily or uh, so we typically will do some amount of uh uh a combination of in-person questions and uh and some test stuff. And I would have assumed that the person would have failed one of those two. Yeah. Uh, but it's definitely a problem uh, because especially, you know, you don't even have to deep fake the way Matt's saying, you could just say you're in a location with the, with the internet's not good enough to do video. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Like, and then you just have to do audio at that point. Yeah. So that would be the other, other method I would do it. Right. And I would probably try to fake somebody that, that, doesn't have a lot of connection in that space, but has the direct real creds right behind yeah. it um, that someone's going to see. So, I, but that is just a kind of out there method, but we're starting to see it. And if the FBI is warning of it, then you probably already have some uh, use of it in the wild, if you will, right? Beyond uh, beyond just a, a summation of an idea. Um, the other the other piece I wanted to touch on that I would probably use to attack you is identity of your of your 
uh, your tenant less so than your human, maybe potentially. And the way I would try to accomplish that, this was actually from 2018, a very long time ago, but a poison peer to peer app kicked off Dofoil coin miner outbreak. Um, right. And it's talking about that. But if you think about, um, enterprise applications in the same vein, Microsoft inter enterprise applications, like if you go into app registrations or enterprise applications in aad.portal.azure.com, um, those enterprise applications have certain privilege. They have certain rights, right? And I can ask for those certain privileges and rights as I ask for them. Um, and so what I can do is start with the user. If I don't have a partner center ID, which I could easily go get, but if I don't have a partner center ID, I can't run signed code. I can't run something that's um, approved, but I can get your user like Calendly, for example, can let you sign in and you get your user details, your user calendar details, your user email details, those kind of things. Um, and that can be done at a user per user level by default in Microsoft. So what I can do is I can create an enterprise app and I have one. Um, I couldn't get access to it because the law of demos, I couldn't get into my DigitalOcean account this morning. It's just the way yeah. it seems to work. But um, I have a Poison Enterprise app it's called Do You Want to Play a Game? And it pops up and just says, you've reached Do You Want to Play a Game app? Would you like to have access from Microsoft? Um, and it's just like when you sign in with Facebook or just when you sign in with Microsoft, it's that OAuth sign in as this identity SSO model that's self-registering. Um, and so you as a user get tricked into clicking this and approving the app. Everything goes on. You go on about your day. The rest of it continues. It tells you you're fine. I actually have a web page that launches instead afterwards that brings up, up your picture from AAD and then your information, your cell phone yeah. number, your manager name, anything I can enumerate from Graph. Um, and I display that on just a simple web page. And so that's what the user sees to try to demonstrate the concept. But imagine I was just harvesting that and then becoming you and being able to read your email. And now it's not you changing your password. That doesn't change anything. Your password has no relationship to the enterprise app. That's an identity layer created application that I now have as almost a permanent link. And depending on what rights I ask for, I could wind up being an admin. I could wind up being yeah. able to do everything almost in the world and more and more as Microsoft converts it. So, you know, Jason, what are your thoughts on defending against enterprise yeah. apps like that? Uh, I mean, a non-zero amount of business email compromise going on right now is just installing an uh, uh, enterprise app as the user, right? And yeah. then sucking the email out. It can send as user, right? Like you can Create do all rules. of those things. Yeah. yeah. So... Uh, you, the biggest defense there is, uh, again, if you have, uh, an advanced policy, I don't know if you can do this as standard or not, you can turn off the ability for users to install enterprise apps. They have to get approved. Yeah. Yeah. And in that setting, uh, Tom basically just says, nope, you cannot register an app. You have to wait, uh, and your administrator will approve it. And it waits in, in that queue. Now, and that's probably ideal because you really, it, it may be inconvenient to your administrator, but I also hope it's not because it, they shouldn't be trying to authorize a lot of apps all the time. That That's just in general, not good behavior. <laughs> so Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And, and I think that if you take it back to security, you know, letting users register apps means that you have no way to determine what your surface area is and where your data lives. Right. And I think that's where you have to have some degree of a planned method of, are we going to use Calendly? Then add it to the business impact analysis and say yes, and let's make sure we're set up correctly for SSO. Let's stop the use of login credentials. Let's tie it direct to this app. Let's put a group around it. Um, you know, those kind of things, right? And so I think as we start thinking about the risk area of identity, it's very apparent that that's going to be a big attack surface for me in the future as your data lives in Salesforce and as your data lives in these extensibilities that I use identity to get to. So For sure. Now, I, I think uh, we're, we reached most of the end of the big list. There's a couple of things we, we can kind of talk that combines the two. So from an external, there is Google dorking. And we're yeah. not going to show it because Google seems to take less kindly on YouTube to diving into it. But just Google Google dorking. Good news is <laughs> Google doesn't stop you from doing it. Uh, you can use it to find all kinds of files and things related. And you'll be shocked at how many companies have somehow published extra memos, internal information that gives you a ton of external information completely passively acquired so nobody at the company is on the wiser that they're being targeted and then you turn it into what matt said so you go from the jason external recon to the matt all right now we want to be this person yeah. they're the person that seems like i want to be they're going to have the right amount of privilege for me to impersonate so i'm going to spearfish that person and how would i spearfish them well I looked under social media and then I said, hey, uh, they really like this or they seem to check in at yep. Buffalo Wild Wings all the time. Let's send them a coupon. Like when you think about it, sometimes it really is as simple as that when it comes to a phishing. Just figure out what they like and figure out what they're most likely to click on. They're probably subscribed to it. And it can be their personal email. Uh, it's way unfortunate. And I recommend you block this. But if you haven't, many employees will check their personal email at work. <laughs> they should not be doing this, but they will do this. <laughs> so it's it's a huge risk factor. 
Yeah, and then use the same passwords, right? Uh-huh. Let's get into the meat of how that all kind of spreads out as well. And I say this, my wife's not within earshot, so I can actually talk about this right now. But <laughs> I got a password manager, and I was so smart. I was like, babe, let's get everything in your password manager. I want all the stuff in that family shared folder. We're going to have access to it with these type of settings and all that kind of stuff, right? And then I'm so happy because she's like, I'm done. It's all in my password manager. I start looking through it one day and using the password. I was like, why is it warning me these passwords are the same? She had literally brought in the exact same password she was using everywhere into said password manager, right? (laughs) And so users are going to be users is kind of my point. And I think it's our job to educate that we have to have a process to force them to do it. We have to have some kind of executive support to go down that path. But yeah, I also wanted to share one more thing real quick, Tom, uh, to your point of how can people educate themselves and just how easy it is for me as a baby threat actor to learn and do these things to, to teach myself where the surface area is. So I brought up a site called kitploit.com. I thought it was interesting because the first thing I saw in here was SMAP, a, do- a drop-in replacement for InMap powered by Shodan.io. So it's now taking InMap and scanning capabilities, but also enriching the data with what it already knows from Shodan, right? So you could imagine. Um, but the point is, this kitploit.com has new types of stuff so you can learn where the world's going, right? A fast tool to scan, SAS, pass, app written in Go, Cirrus Go. And so it's it's to go and take a domain name and go find where all these other endpoints exist. Where does a uh, where does an SSO endpoint exist? Where does a, right? So you you can start seeing a world from an identity centrism and how that extends out into all these applications. But the tools are so easy to get. And I, I play around with probably five to six tools a month out of this category um, and catalog. Um, so I guess I just said, if you want to attack Matt, put new tool that attacks Matt in this catalog. Yeah, um, but, Matt's downloading them. I digress. This, yeah. is you, this is how you fish Matt. <laughs> yeah, uh, I digress. Also worth mentioning, and we didn't say this, I think, very well in the beginning, but it, Nestandard.com, a lot of it was because their same admin or sales emails are also where they point the infrastructure. Um, I like companies that do things like, in, I'm guilty of this too, to an extent. Uh, you register a completely seemingly an SSO domain. To your a, yeah, yeah, yeah. Come to play asynchronous my, to you. My somewhat findable infrastructure.com. We don't even know whose this is, but it's not likely someone's going to search it. It's a way that you can still have the convenience of having things pointed at domains because it's easier to remember. That way, when you move things around, shuffle large amounts of infrastructure, but at the same time, um, you're not publicly exposing it. So there's it, it's just a couple different things you can think of to start creating that separation between yourself. And it goes without saying, but it's worth saying right here. I like Screen Connect. I use Screen Connect, but I don't need to be admin to use it to uh, uh, you know, to help people. So there is Tom, and there is a completely different, not the word admin user, who logs in to do the updates to Screen Connect or do an admin privilege because I just don't need it on a daily basis. And this is something that's really hard to convince IT and MSP people that they don't need to log in as administrator all day long. Yeah. Uh, they should have separate accounts for these things. That way, if you get fished, hopefully you were not logged into that extra privileged account because you only go in there. Don't check your email in a privileged account, by the way. <laughs> you're, you're limiting blast radius, right? At, yeah. When I was at my MSP as the director of security, the way I looked at it was I wanted to remove the blast radius as much as possible and limit the damage because I lived compromised. And so the term I used was live compromised um, in, in that sense and trying to t- say, okay, if Tom's always going to be good Tom and then sometimes bad Tom, right, because of this impermanence of trust, then how do I take when bad Tom appears and limit the damage that bad Tom can do? Um, and right. that's why that separation of admin rights, that's why principles of least privilege, that's why I are back, all those things. But yeah. I know we all have to run. I don't want to run, you know, me, you can pull my string, I'll go for like 400 hours. But uh, <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> Let us know in the comments what you think of all this. Uh, we All these things will be linked down there. So all of you have some homework to do to check all of the privileges that you have. Click all the links. Donate to the Beard Charity, whether it's the 2022 edition or further on. And uh, reach out to these guys, too. They have a wealth of information. They have uh, channels and social media and LinkedIn that they can be connected with on it as well. So thanks, everyone, who hung out this long. And, uh, yeah, just enjoying. This is fun. We may do more of these. Let us know in the comments down below. Thanks. We can explore Thank a lot you. of fun things. See you. Yes. All right. See you later. And thank you for making it all the way to the end of this video. If you've enjoyed the content, please give us a thumbs up. If you would like to see more content from this channel, hit the subscribe button and the bell icon. If you'd like to hire a sure project, head over to lawrencesystems.com and click the Hire Us button right at the top.
To help this channel out in other ways, there's a join button here for YouTube and a Patreon page where your support is greatly appreciated. For deals, discounts, and offers, check out our affiliate links in the description of all of our videos, including a link to our shirt store where we have a wide variety of shirts that we sell and designs come out, well, randomly, so check back frequently. And finally, our forums. Forums.lawrencesystems.com is where you can have a more in-depth discussion about this video and other tech topics covered on this channel. Thanks again for watching and look forward to hearing from you.